So we've computed the GCD, the greatest common divisor of two whole numbers, by invoking the Euclidean algorithm. But one of the themes of mathematics is generalization. We can often take something that originally was designed to work in a more specific context and then generalize, apply it to that broader context. And even when the results don't quite make sense, there still might be some interesting consequences. So let's apply this kind of thinking to the uh, greatest common divisor situation. Let's act as if we were going to compute the GCD of the square root of 2 and the square root of 3, and let's just see what happens. So I want to give some geometric perspective on the Euclidean algorithm as well. So we'll draw a rectangle of width root 3 and height root 2. Now, if we're thinking about the Euclidean algorithm geometrically, I would be asking us to think about how many times root 2 fits inside root 3. And uh, well, we can fit one copy of the square root of 2 inside the square root of 3. So now let's write this down uh, algebraically. All right, we'd write down uh, the square root of 3, and we want to write down our division problem. So the square root of 3 is equal to uh, how many copies of the square root of 2? So we can fit one copy of the square root of 2 into the square root of 3, but there's some remainder, and that remainder is root 3 minus root 2. Now we're doing the Euclidean algorithm, so we iterate, and we ask ourselves how many times does the previous stage's remainder divide the square root of 2? So we can represent that geometrically by drawing squares of side length root 3 minus root 2. And we see that there are four of those squares uh, that would fit into that length of the square root of 2. And we've got a remainder left over. The remainder is uh, 5 root 2 minus 4 root 3. Now we're on to the next stage in the Euclidean algorithm. We've got root 3 minus root 2. And I want to know how many times the previous stage's remainder fits into that. We can think about that geometrically by drawing a couple squares. Those squares have side length 5 root 2 minus 4 root 3. And we can see that there's two of them. So the quotient there is 2, but we've got that very narrow piece remaining. And that very narrow piece corresponds to the remainder of 9 root 3 minus 11 root 2. And because that piece was so narrow, that remainder is very small. 9 root 3 minus 11 root 2 is so small that you might say it's approximately 0. And consequently, 9 root 3 is approximately 11 root 2. Now, doing just a little bit of algebra reveals that the square root of 3 halves is approximately 11 ninths. Now, 11 ninths squares to 121 80 firsts, and 3 halves is exactly 120 80 ths. So what we found here is an exceptionally good rational approximation to the square root of 3 halves. I'm not sure what I expected to have happen when we applied the Euclidean algorithm to two real numbers like this, but this is a really neat consequence. We were able to get this exceptionally good rational approximation to the square root of 1.5. So I'm selling this as if this is some sort of generalization of the Euclidean algorithm to, to arbitrary real numbers. But that's kind of a lie. I mean, we're really getting back to our roots. You know, what we're really doing here is, is geometry. And after all, why was someone like Euclid, clearly a geometer, interested in something like GCD, which maybe seems like the purview of number theory? Well, one key reason is a search for commensurability, a search for a common unit that could measure two different lengths. And that's exactly what we're seeing uh, uh, here when we draw these kind of geometric pictures and we're trying to compute the GCD. Well, in any case, let's try to do the same kind of game, but instead of trying to compute, compute the GCD of uh, root 2 and root 3, let's try to do the same kind of game, but for log 2 and log 3. So I'll again start by drawing a rectangle, this time of width log 3 and height log 2. Then the Euclidean algorithm asks us to think about how many times log 2 fits inside log 3. And we can fit log 2 inside log 3 once. That's the big square there. And there's some remainder. The remainder is log 3 minus log 2. So the first step of the Euclidean algorithm uh, is summarized as follows. Log 3 is one copy of log 2 plus this remainder of log 3 minus log 2. Now I want to know how many times that remainder of log 3 minus log 2 fits into log 2. Well, I can only fit the one square in there, so log 2 is one copy of that previous remainder, log 3 minus log 2, plus this new remainder of 2 log 2 minus log 3. Now at this next stage, I can only fit one square in there. So I'll record this in the next step of the Euclidean algorithm. 
Now in this next stage, the quotient is two, right, which I can visibly see because I can fit two squares in there. And then I'll record that in the next step of the Euclidean algorithm. So now I'll divide two log three minus three log two by eight log two minus five log three. I'll get a quotient of two, and I'll record that in this uh, next stage of the Euclidean algorithm. Now, if I'd been doing this with whole numbers, I'd, I'd eventually get a remainder of zero. I mean, log three and log two are not commensurable, so this process will never actually end. But this remainder that I've got at this stage, 12 log three minus 19 log two, that remainder is quite small. And consequently, 12 log three is approximately 19 log two. Now that coincidence of logarithms tells us that three to the 12th power is very close to two to the 19th power. Dividing both sides by two to the 12th reveals that three halves raised to the 12th power is very close to two to the seventh. This approximate equality has a certain musical interpretation. We see that two notes are separated by an octave if one note is twice the frequency of the other. And we see that two notes are separated by a fifth if one note is three halves the frequency of the other. So this is saying, musically, that 12 fifths is about seven octaves. And because this is a musical fact, it's something that we can try to hear. So let's listen to seven octaves. So now I'll start at that same low note and I'll move up 12 fifths. it's an approximate equality, so those two notes aren't exactly the same. Let's listen to the result of going up 12 fifths again, and going up seven octaves, 12 fifths, seven octaves. And to be precise, 12 fifths is a bit more than seven octaves, so that note, after moving up 12 fifths, is a bit higher than what we got when we moved up seven octaves. This is a neat example, in part because it shows just how connected mathematics is to everything else. Some of you have already seen the circle of fifths, maybe in a music theory context. And it's cool how that's connected to things like log two, log three, and also this uh, sort of interesting take on the Euclidean algorithm. Ooh, and there's a historical footnote here as well. So what we're calling the Euclidean algorithm, Euclid's algorithm, is probably not actually due to Euclid. It actually has its roots in older mathematics due to the Pythagoreans. And the Pythagoreans were interested in things like special ratios and music. So maybe this musical connection that we're seeing is maybe not so surprising.